As this completes our series of discussions on the philosophy of General Albert Pike, I think we should devote just a little time to a more thorough or at least more critical consideration of his philosophical writings as they are available to the public. Most of General Pike's work has never been has never been within the observation or notice of most readers. Many of his principal writings have not as yet appeared in print, and on a number of his manuscripts, the general placed the admonition that they should never be published. He felt in principle that his researches belong to a laboratory stage of searching. He felt that others would have to come after him, review, polish, and complete these patterns of observation and reflection before they should be given to the public in general. As a result of that, in the Albert Pike room, in the House of the Temple in Washington, there are rows of volumes beautifully bound containing only his manuscripts. These manuscripts were written with quill pens, which he cut himself. And as one more recent observer noted, while they would not write underwater like a ballpoint pen, they were able to be used very effectively. And the general small and detailed penmanship, quite to be expected from a person of huge physical proportions, uh, this uh, writing is very legible and quite old-fashioned and indicates uh, a very clear period in which the work was done. Those of his works which are available must be uh, headed, of course, by the Morals and Dogma, which is probably the most easily securable of his books. Uh, our library has a number of other items which are considered to be extremely scarce. For example, here is a copy of his work, the Sefa Hedebran, which means literally the Book of the Words. In this uh, little research volume, the general attempted to explain and define nearly all of the curious and unusual words that are found in the two testaments. Most of the work was derived either from the Chaldean Hebrew or the Greek. But Pike labored under the sincere conviction that proper names in sacred writings must be translated that one of the reasons why we have made some curious and quite understandable errors has been that we have not realized the allegorical intent of many so-called or believed to be historical passages. Only by the study of the names and of certain particular words and terms are we in a position to actually discover the true intent of the message? Therefore, in this volume, the general examines such words as were used to represent God, Adam, Eve, man in general, the names of tribes and of countries, the names of heroes and of patriarchs, and he found his searching most rewarding, for he was able to point out the great number of instances in which the translation of the proper name immediately oriented the entire concept, released its locked significance, and in some cases rescued the reader from certain rather desperate lit literal situations, such as the story of Jonah and the whale. 
the meaning behind the words caused him to do this work which of course also includes many words and terms which appear in the rituals of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Of this little volume, 100 copies were published, and Pike left the admonition that it was not to be reprinted. It never has been, so there are only 100 copies in existence. This type of restriction, while at his time possibly more important than it is to us today, means that a very large part of his scholarship is locked away from our common knowledge. Another interesting type of work which the general did was to investigate and explore the great Pythagorean theory of number. Many people are interested in numerology, but unfortunately the majority of them cannot use General Pike's reference work. Under the general title of Lectures on Masonic Symbolism, Pike devotes this work to the philosophy, the religious significance, and the allegorical meaning of the concept of number. He derives from most of the classical authors of his time and of ancient times with particular dependence upon the old texts relating to Pythagoras with which he was familiar in the original Greek. So here is another rare work which the general prepared. Only 100 copies were issued and each copy was signed by General Pike as the Sovereign Grand Commander and was presented personally to one of his uh, fellow members of the Supreme Council. In this particular volume, the member involved inserted a very nice picture of the general in his scholastic years. But this uh, shows the general way in which these materials have been more or less locked away from us and made inaccessible to the average person. Again, by his admonition, uh, this work should not be reprinted. A third volume which carries uh, part of the same idea is the continuation of this series of lectures, which he continued into another volume. This entire volume dealing almost entirely with the significance of the Sanskrit Amkaya, or the great Amkara syllable, the AUM or OM formula. Here again, the work is restricted to 100 copies, and the book was issued uh, rather with a sketchy beginning and no author's name. Uh, this type of uh, uh, situation follows throughout all of Pike's works. His magnum opus, which is the complete rewriting of the degrees of the Scottish Rite, also exists only in a hundred copies. Thus he never apparently went forth into what you might term general production of books. And uh, we hope that in the course of time, the rapidly increasing interest in these fields will justify some relaxation of the old restriction, and that gradually demand will bring many of these splendid writings to light. This demand must come not only from uh, Masonic scholars, but from all other groups who recognize the universality of scholarship itself, and are therefore not to be over-influenced uh, by any term which seems to be limiting. Uh, the general was indeed a universal thinker, free of most of the impedimenta of time and place, and as such, his material is of continuing value. Now this evening, our principal concern is General Pike's explanations of the reason why he was imperiled uh, to achieve a restoration of the theory of ritualistic instruction. And as might be expected of him, his defense, his argument, and if you want to formally call it, his apology for his own position, was backed, or were backed, with constant 
references uh, to many cultures, including not only the Near East, but also Japan and China. In an effort to explain why ritualism is significant and how it affects the truth seeker in his search for knowledge. Spike begins with a concept which I think we must all accept, namely that ritualism has played an important part in religion since the dawn of time. And in searching among primitive people where ritualism seems to have its origin, we must come to another almost universal acceptance, namely that ritualism begins within the individual. It is not imposed upon him. It is the expression of his own consciousness. Ritualism is nothing more or less than his thoughts and emotions moving through his body and causing his body to express them. Basically, then, the individual who gesticulates, the primitive savage who does his dance of victory, the individual who in mourning or in pain assumes certain almost inevitable postures, the individual who under stress defends himself through certain contractions of his body, causing him to appear, to draw into himself, or to pass into some slight exaggeration of mannerism. These are all aspects of ritualism, for they are the transforming of abstract qualities of feeling and mentation into some visible, physical, symbolical equivalent. Every action which we perform even the function of the senses themselves constitute some kind of symbolic in interpretation or extension of our own consciousness. We do things because we feel in one way or we think in another. Whenever we perform even a familiar or common action, we are transforming an impulse into a deed. And because the body has certain natural functions and has limitations upon the possible expression of itself, these manifestations take on stylization. We cannot move as we please, we move as we can. And we gradually uh, identify our pleasure and our ability so that our emotion is within the possibility or the means of the body which we use. Early in experience man developed a series of primitive rituals associated with the common experiences of living. Rituals nearly always involved more than one person, although not always. And ritualism gradually began to take the form of a common action several individuals uniting in the performance of some particular pageantry of symbolical self-expression. Ritual moved out uh, from the original sanctuary to become part of many different uh, expressions of artistry, creativity. It became involved in theater, in dance, it finds its way uh, more subtly than we realize into painting and sculpture. And poetry is a harmonic ritual of words. Almost everything that we do, if it is done graciously, if it is done beautifully, becomes art. And ritualism moving from man is involved in the art of self-expression the expression of things most meaningful and most important. Ritualism, therefore, also sh shares to a degree with the meaning of glyphs, pictoglyphs, graphic representations by prehistoric human beings. Thus a glyph is a form capturing an idea. 
A ritualistic procedure is an arrangement or a pattern or a device capturing a mood and peculiarly expressing it. We find this in music, where nearly any mood that we desire, particularly the Greek musical modes, may be drawn forth out of us because we are subjected to certain harmonic tonal patterns. To these we respond. Here ritual is in the form of sound, appealing to the ear primarily, but later influencing nearly all parts of our composite nature. Going into ritualism a little further, um, we find another element introduced. As ritualism grew, it became a disciplined expression. Just as glyphs were simply not drawn as children draw them, without any sense of meaning, lines or forms upon paper. But glyphs had to have a certain figure or a certain stature in order to express a particular idea. So ritualism, coming under an orderly function of man, by degrees took the form of a kind of language of motion. The various figures devised in ritual, the sequences of the actions of the participants, uh, the magnificent assemblies, choruses, processions, all these came under an orderly development so that a certain ritual or a certain rite became distinctly identified with a certain religion, with a certain meaning. And among the Greeks, these rituals, like architecture itself, became symbolical of certain deities, certain spiritual beings certain truths, certain broad and deep convictions which were continuously presented in this form. General Pike points out that in ancient ritualism there was a factor which we apparently have lost. How we lost it he was not entirely certain. Perhaps today we are in a little better position to clarify this because the advancement has been made in fields of psychological research. His point is that nearly all rituals in ancient times involved magic. That some kind of a pattern was created which induced a particular and peculiar mood, exercising a kind of mesmeric spell, causing individuals to be bound together and to have an experience beyond that, normally available to them in the common concourse of living. Those of you who have attended uh, the rain dances in the southwest part of the United States, up in one of those Mesa villages, will have some concept of what Pike meant. Perhaps being in New Mexico himself for a time, he saw these dances in their earlier and purer forms. But his point is, and we see it still, that if you sit quietly watching these dances, listening to the almost endless rhythm of the drums, watching the interminable motion of their feet, the feet of the dancers, watching the strange designs which they form weaving in and out, with the skill of a Russian trained ballet. If you keep on watching this, listening to the tones, seeing the wonderful pageantry of color, and observing the remarkable makeup and adorning of the dancers, you will in a short time find yourself moved away from the everyday you will find a kind of strange disorientation within your own consciousness. You will feel as though as a strange, subtle, inscrutable force 
was moving in upon you, that these dancers were emanating something, that the whole complete pattern was alive with a kind of force, that this force swept over the spectator, that he felt it picking him up, moving him out of his normal thinking and his normal feeling, and tying him to an ageless atavism within himself. Pike realized that in the classical periods of Greek religious initiation, that these sacred dramas, designed and devised by persons unknown, but presumably bestowed originally by the gods, that these dramas were not merely something to see. Uh, the participant was a part of a living formula. The observer was able in a mysterious way to capture the overtones, ritual providing something that appealed to faculties that could not directly listen to words, nor could they be moved by the most sober intellectual instruction. Actually, ritualism was an experience rather than an instruction. It applied its force directly to the eyes of man. And here there is a strange certainty that is denied to almost any other sensory perception. That which a man sees, that he instinctively believes and accepts as true. He believes that his reason may be deceived, but his sight cannot be deceived. That what comes directly into his vision is as it appears to be, and about it there can be no uncertainty. Thus ritualism, passing or bypassing the rational faculties, giving no time in its unfolding for the individual to sit back and intellectualize, sweeps him along from one mood to another, carrying him, as in the Greek rituals and in many other sacred rites, in the direction of a collective sublimity. He feels himself departing from this world and entering into a world of divine things. He is no longer aware that the symbolic deities before him are priests, masked and robed. He is no longer aware that these rituals are taking place in a house built by men and that their fantasy is enlarged by mechanical devices. These factors cease to be important. There is the immediate impact of the splendor itself. This splendor moving some source of splendor or some instinct to splendor within the human constitution. This is the magic to which General Pike refers. It is this magic of unworldliness, this magic of freedom from the commonplace, this magic of being set apart into another kind of world, a world that will endure while the rites continue. It is as though the candidate passing through these rituals actually did go to a different world and came face to face with beings and powers, transcendent and remote. This ritualism inevitably affects the person. Civilized travelers wandering in primitive nations have felt the impact of it and have suddenly realized that their vaunted sophistry slips away from them, that the ritual moves in and the modern way of life moves out. Yet in the smug security of a non-ritualistic daily living, we do not feel this danger of being picked up and carried away into an ancient spell of some kind. Ritualism, because of this peculiar uh, value or dimension of itself, is in many respects an almost perfect form of instruction. And in the great ritualistic mysteries, it combined with nearly every other sensory faculty in giving a new 
set of instruments by which the individual could be moved, uh, could be caused to be inwardly animated, and could be impelled to forget himself, his daily concerns, the small projects which normally motivated him, and share again in the ancient ceremonies. Pike points out that nearly all rituals have psychologically been influenced by the motions of nature. That actually man in creating these symbolic patterns is following the law of universal motion. He is creating great sweeping dances like the motions of the planets in the sky the processions of stars moving forever above him, the motion of rivers flowing from their sources to the sea, the movement of wind in the, in the field of tall ripe grain. These things seem ritualistic. They seem to belong to currents and energies from which we are divided by our own particular and special ways of living and thinking. Also, ritual has a certain advantage over other forms of instruction inasmuch as the word is unnecessary. Persons of different concepts, different backgrounds, different races can share in the common experience of rhythmic motion, like uh, art painting particularly as it was used in the medieval religious life of Europe. The picture indeed tells more than 5,000 words. The picture is perfectly intelligible to the illiterate person or the stranger who cannot speak our tongue. He gains the same message because he is reading with his eyes not letters or words but the symbolic restoration of processes or concepts. Ritual, furthermore, because it possesses a certain theatrical dimension, makes possible a strange and wonderful effect upon the mind through the distorting of literalities. Many things in their very literal ways are so commonplace to us that they do not move us. But the moment we create a situation not familiar different from anything we know, we become lost in that situation because we cannot control it. The familiar situation we can control, but not the unfamiliar. Thus the uh, dancers in some ceremony may be our friends, even our relatives and members of our household, but when they are masked and regaled and in various ways separated so that our eyes see in them nothing familiar, nothing that we know, but only strange emblems of birds and beasts. This disorientation separates them from their human estate and gives them a significance apart from the common things which we know. Thus ritual has a tendency to break through uh, the walls which our training and our education uh, have built around our imagination. Ritual releases the imaging power, the creative imaginative imagery of our own inner lives. Ritual then is a kind of an escape from the prosaic into a world of fantasy where even fairy stories can be true where old legends and lore suddenly come to life, and where great principles long observed but ignored suddenly become undeniable. All these points have much to do with the descent of this ancient way of instruction. This instruction by creating moods, by causing, causing us to feel certain things with a tremendous urgent intensity a feeling which can possess us. Today we know uh, that man, far from being the intellectual creature that we think he is, is still 
almost totally a being of emotions. That the mind has become a kind of crown jewel in this coronet of senses, we know. But the average person is not converted, directed, or instructed by his mind alone, or by the minds of others. Without feeling, without the intense experience of participating, sharing, being part of something. Imagination is not quickened and understanding is not ripened. What we have gone through, what we have experienced, what we have intimately felt, these are the things which move us and cause the rise of certainties within our own consciousness. In ritualism, as it was presented in ancient times, therefore man was divided into a twofold creature, one part of himself living in the world and the other part in a mysterious temple that was separate from the world. He had an outer and an inner life. He had two kinds of language with which he could converse the language of the everyday and the sacred language of the mysteries. He lived always on the threshold of a universal condition which was no further from him than the door of the sanctuary. From his fields, from the marketplace, from the uh, station or estate which he possessed, the individual walked through the great plumed archway of columns and, and immediately he was no longer in the common world. This is an experience we are losing uh, very rapidly, this sense of two-worldliness. This sense that ever near us is another world ever different. Today, even when we enter into a place of worship, some way we do not usually get that sense of otherworldliness unless we enter into a great cathedral or some place so magnificent in its sanctity, in its artistry, in its mass, that we are simply swept off our feet. Thus we come to cling ever more closely to ordinary things. Our small problems, our daily existence, these become tremendously real to us and there is no contrast. There is no other world of vision and of higher sight that seemingly can reach us. If we have vision at all, it must be from within ourselves. We do not know what it means to step with a few short paces from the world of man to the world of God. Now perhaps all this is rather physical, Maybe it shouldn't be that way, but at the same time it is that way, so we have to face it. We have to face this wonderful experience, the experience which we have lost when in a strange manner of some kind we sort of exiled the gods back to the sky and left them there. Today we, uh, we look for them in very rarefied atmosphere, but we have no idea of our ancient Roman brethren who had a couple of these deities under his hearthstone most of the time, and under the name of the Lares and Penates, always left out a little food for them every evening. He conversed with them, he told his troubles to them. Perhaps it was idolatry. Perhaps he was not too wise a man about it all, but there was something that made the gods seem near something that made it less necessary for him to search desperately for his spiritual consolation. He did not feel that it was necessary for him to renounce the world, that it was necessary for him to suffer, that it was necessary for him uh, to modify the flesh or to perform strange and extraordinary rites of purification. The gods of antiquity were not demanding gods. For the most part, they were rather char uh, charitable, 
congenial beings who seem to have a wonderful understanding of man's natural weaknesses and at the same time a paternal regard in which it might be that they could lead him to a nobler way of living. But ritual meant that heaven and earth could meet in any great festival, in any great solemn event. Values, too, were differently distributed. Instead of spiritual values being on one side completely separate, and material values on the other totally isolated, these values flowed together. There was no separation in them at all. There was no problem of the individual trying to decide whether it was more important to live well here or hereafter. He felt the natural fact that he lived here and hereafter always. But the hereafter was no distant place he went when he died. The hereafter was merely a step into a world of living dream and vision, a world of wonders, a world of magnificent things that were also tangible. He did not live in a world of physical things that were tangible and spiritual things that were intangible. intangible. By ritualism, the invisible was also tangible. The invisible became just as near to him and as real to him as his horses, his cattle, and his fields. He did not have to deny everything that he saw in order to believe everything he could not see. He could see nearly everything. So out of the pomp and circumstance of a probably rather corrupt Athenian election, he could pass quietly into the Orphic sanctuary where nothing was corrupt. He could live in a world in which that which was not corrupt was supported by the corrupt. Where individuals who were not good paid homage to that which was good. Where these politicians, having variously profaned their offices, were literally and actually afraid to enter the sanctuary maintained by the state. Their gods were so near and the danger of retribution was so close uh, that the corrupted man did not dare to worship. This is uh, an interesting difference to our way of things. And yet this same corrupted man did not dare not to worship. He could not leave his faith behind, deny his immortal soul, and live as he pleased with a good hope. These things were not possible. There was an entirely different dimension of living. Unfortunately, some of the ancients have left to us a, de de a description or definition of some of these rites. Not complete, because such would have been contrary to their obligations. But in the mysterious nocturnal rites of Osiris, in an island in the Nile, Iamblichus describing the initiation of the mother of the gods and many other similar passages, including the initiation described by Apuleius in the Metamorphosis, we see that all the thinking in connection with these great ritualistic processes, this thinking led inevitably to the temple. It led the individual, regardless of his natural passions or desires, to view the inevitable eternal significance of the sacred life. When the young people of Athens uh, reached a certain age, and it was rather young at some times, because we know that children as young as five and six years of age were initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries, that these young people starting out in life perhaps not even yet in the public school. They were not taken to some place where they heard sermons or heard learned discussions of sin beyond their contemplation or where they could learn some of the better lessons involved therein. These children were taken into the great spectacle of the gods. They realized that heaven and earth met in a tremendous homage paid by man to the eternal. 
that the greatest artistry, the greatest skill, the greatest mind, all of these forms of greatness were dedicated to the gods. And that skill and wisdom and love and veneration adorned the ancient altars with garlands of great beauty and great richness. These children found when they entered sanctuary, not children only, they found there the wise and the learned whom they admired. They found the great scientist worshipping humbly beside the common shopkeeper. They saw that no man became so wise that he outgrew the love to worship the gods. He learned that no amount of material prosperity could compensate for being rejected by the mysteries. That a person not regarded as fit to enter the sanctuary of the gods was not fit for any man on earth to associate with. It is understandable that under such a psychology, under such a concept, that the value of divine things was driven home and the young person grew up to realize that these sacred ceremonies were part of his own maturity that he, they were not something he should ever be ashamed of or apologize for or that he would ever be ridiculed because he was superstitious enough to accept them they were the way of life they were the proper and reasonable thing for every person to experience. And out of this experience to build a life as noble as personal ability would permit. Now as Pike points out, ritualism being a form of symbolism, the literal or obvious interpretation is seldom the true one. Ritualism, like sacred or scriptural writing, is a very difficult thing because it must have many meanings. It must be able to meet and console the spirit of the simple man. It must also be forever beyond the understanding of the wisest. Ritual, therefore, like symbolism, has no limitation upon it other than the limitation of the interpreting mind or consciousness. What it stands for in sure and complete substance, no man knows. Because no man has ever exhausted its meanings. He has never come to the point where he can say, this means no more. As veil he lifts, he finds veil upon veil behind. Always the symbol lures him on. Always the ritual reveals new meaning, like some magnificent tapestry. In this way, many levels of thinkers were brought into the concept of the great ritualistic procedure. Hippocrates of Kos, the father of medicine, performing the rituals of initiation, beheld in the splendor of them the workings of God, the great physician. He saw all the elements of the great drama unfold in terms of healing. Cicero, a legislator, a great statesman and an orator, declared that as he stood in the presence of these great ceremonies, he became for the first time aware of the divinity of jurisprudence. He stood in the presence of the ever-living, ever-moving harmony of universal law, and he recognized it. The rituals were lawful. They were the great unfolding of the principles of integrity in nature. A poet found in them the wonderful meters of great verse. The philosopher experienced in them the tremendous depths of metaphysical speculation. The mystic found there in the strange uh, symbolism the simple and open road to the heart of reality. 
Each brought himself. Each received that which was suitable to his need. And the great drama of the gods went on, never pausing, always impelling the individual to the recognition of the total sublimity, the total sufficiency of the heavenly plan. Now man taking this mood upon himself experienced something. He experienced certainties. Certainties perhaps which he himself bestowed, but which nevertheless remained certain certainties. He did not argue with learning. He did not debate with the wise. He did not deny, protest, criticize, condemn. He was silent. And in this silence, he was open to the strange rites themselves. He felt them as some wonderful pageantry, moving in, controlling, taking over, and impressing him with the total impact of a total truth. In this way, a pipe felt that symbolism through ritual was of the greatest practical importance in education. He felt that there were inevitable and invaluable realities which died in the very process of explaining them. That we took thoughts, put them into words and killed them. That we found no way to keep the spirits alive while we perpetuated the ideas. The spirit died, lost in words, lost in man's semantic blunderings, lost in the difficulties of transmission, lost in the fact that words that mean much to us may mean little to others. Thus, education, learning, can by books and rote transmit the three R's, but cannot transmit a fourth R, religion, that cannot in the reveal or release a fifth R, reality. These things have to be found in another way. Man searching for these values in his daily life finds them by the very fact of living. He is not told that. He discovers that out of their own need in his own living and in his own daily existence. So by the degrees of years, he is initiated into wisdom. By having walked these paths, performed these rites of human adjustment, the individual begins to inwardly apprehend meanings otherwise obscure to him. Thus the aged have passed through ceremonies that the young cannot know. And from these ceremonies and initiation have gained something in the name of maturity, which can only be learned by the doing. Ritualism becomes the nearest equivalent that we have to the actual right of doing. Because in many ancient ceremonies, the individuals, the candidates, the observers, the audience also participated in some way, particularly the young person in the puberty rites or initiation rituals of his tribe. Today we take it for granted that a young person born in a certain nation is a citizen. Antiquity did not make it so light and easy a matter. Antiquity said that every man must be born twice once into this world and once into his own maturity, and that these rituals of maturity conferred with them the privilege of participation in mature things, that the individual could not be allowed just to grow up. He had to accept with growth his duty. He had to accept the challenge of the enlargement of his own character, he was only a citizen when he was useful. He had only a right to share in the life of his people when he was prepared and equipped to defend his own people in their needs 
or serve them in their duties and burdens. Thus, citizenship was a ritual, a ritual by which the young person not only passed over a bridge of time, but passed over it with solemn sacraments, and thus came into maturity dedicated by sacred ways and sacred rites, dedicated to the works of maturity, to the works of responsibility. And having thus been dedicated and consecrated, he became one of his people and was willing to live for his people and, if necessary, die for his people. These experiences are lost to us. We cannot bring back the old times nor the old ways of doing things. No, can we bring the mystery temples from their ancient ruins? We can, however, recognize something we should all know, and we should realize it every day. Namely, that there is in the midst of us today the legitimate descendant of ritual, and that is theater. Theater began in the sanctuary of Dionysus. Theater began as a presentation of the great mysteries. Theater was the ancient depiction of the way of heaven. It furthermore gradually unfolded into a deeply psychologically significant unfolding of the attributes and qualities of human nature. By theater man vicariously experienced man and every experience had to be sound had to be right, had to carry within it the sacred responsibility of art. We know today the tremendous moving power of theater. We all experience the spell of great theater. We know that we forget ourselves and move into the play. We know that hours pass and we do not note their passing. That we are ushered into worlds and conditions previously beyond our conception. These things are part of ritual. Yet do we, at the end, find that theater still serves the ancient gods? Unfortunately, in most cases, it does not. It has drifted away into a service of our own material instincts and emotions. It entertains us without informing us. It takes our time without bestowing a proper credit for that time. Yet it is here as one of the potentially powerful instruments of education and enlightenment. It must again be rededicated to the purpose for which it was devised. Until such is done, we have deprived ourselves of one of the most civilizing forces which have come down to us from old times. General Pike, contemplating this situation in terms of human necessity and recognizing, particularly in his day, that a young country coming into its maturity through a long and difficult struggle such as the Civil War preceded by the Revolutionary War, that this young country with vast frontiers to explore, with great adventuring to be done on the simple plane of physical activity could very easily drift away uh, from its footings in philosophy and religion. The religion could lose its dynamic, becoming merely a part of a social background, present, respected, but not experienced. Here, and prominently here, but not leading not fulfilling man's spiritual need. The failure of ritual, the failure of the sublimity of religion in the life of man has probably contributed a great deal to the rising tide of neurosis which apparently threatens to drown the race. We have no outlets, we have no sublimity. We have no great value unspeakable, unchangeable beauties in which we can take refuge or which come to us with a surging majesty in time of trouble. 
when we look inside of ourselves there is a darkness and a fear or perhaps only a faint glimmer of hope like the tiny light in the end of some ancient ritualistic corridor we do not have the power to move into ourselves and find this inside this magnificent unfolding of the spiritual pageantry of our conviction this is because around us we have not seen it and what we have not seen what we have not visibly experienced does not easily take form in the subconscious the great structure of antiquity had its religion centered in its subconscious religion was inside placed there by the very circumstances which with us place other things there to us there is the ritual of trade barter and exchange we face it constantly therefore it moves inside of us but the great ritual of man's rejoicing and the wonder beauty and integrity of the universe in which he lives that ritual has not moved in a modern man yet it has not died it is there but it sleeps sleeps because we have found no way to awaken it or perhaps have not even tried the fact that it is not dead is testified to by the fact that the moment we come into the situations in which remotely it does exist we are moved by it and find the same old inclinations uh, that possess the Greeks the Latins the Medes and the Persians all of these old feelings are there but obscured uh, by the difficulties and superficial pressures of modern living how then shall we attempt to restore these values what went into ancient ritualism what parts of learning were embodied in it pike tells us more or less quoting from pythagoras and iamblichus <coughs> that it is not a question of what went into it the mere question is everything came out of it mathematics science art literature music philosophy religion these things came out of the mysteries they did not create these sacred rites these sacred rites created them man contemplating upon the mysteries discovered geometry man contemplating upon the mysteries explained astronomy man contemplating upon the mysteries gave forth from himself music dance by intelligent and civilized persons should have condoned such institutions are we to marry these thoughts with the ideas and principles and teachings of men like Pythagoras and Plato are we to assume that Plato was a charlatan or a stupid fool when he declared that when he stood in the presence of the great hierophant of the rites he was as a little child knowing nothing was he completely overwhelmed merely by velvet and golden sandals we cannot imagine that such is the case nor can we imagine that the greatest and most creative minds of all time passed through these rites and afterwards enriched the world as no other group has ever enriched it we have had many composers but Pythagoras discovered the scale by which we compose we have had many astronomers but Ptolemy was the one who gave us the great concepts of mathematical patterning by which we developed the astronomical theory we have used these things in many ways we have had countless doctors through the ages and for two thousand years and more they have taken their solemn obligation by the Hippocratic oath an oath dedicated to the gods an oath written and conceived 400 years before the Christian era in a pagan sanctuary these principles these great ethical patterns have come down to us from those who had received the mysteries 
obviously then there has to be something however we wish to regard it and in terms of more rationalistic psychology leaving the way for the moment many of the great and perhaps extravagant overtones of the old time we are still face to face with the sober fact that these institutions were the great clinics of man's normalcy they were the great hospitals of his soul and indeed these mysteries were the mothers of heroes from whose womb came forth the teachers of the world we need something perhaps we need the concept that was locked in these tremendous institutions sanctified by the veneration of ages this whole concept could be and must be revived in some way not carrying with it something from the past but moving into the future on the basis of the mystical experience made available to man through the unification and rededication of his knowledge his vision his wisdom his hope and his faith until some such motion is achieved we are going to certainly lack foundations in eternity foundations upon which we can build things that will survive a time and survive the selfishness of generations or the stupidities of centuries there has to be this great basic thing now many religions today in modified form have perpetuated rituals most of these rituals have been abridged, cut down, to favor the haste of man. But the difficulty with these rituals, as they are now given to us, as Pike points out, the difficulty is twofold. First, in the course of time, most of these rituals, through abridgment, through reforming, which is sometimes only casting things out of all form, through the reinterpretation by sects and various groups and creeds the rituals have lost their ancient solidity they've lost their ancient authority they are now perpetuations of pretty patterns which those pre performing do not understand and those observing do not comprehend thus the the tremendous vitality is simply lacking yet the principle does survive and in the fact that it does come down to us there is a hope that something more can be accomplished realizing that all of the arts and sciences flowed from this source we perhaps can think of the words of Socrates uh, to the effect that a man may outgrow his teacher but he can never outgrow his natural respect and regard for one who has shown him the way we may outgrow the past but we do not outgrow the need to respect its accomplishments even if we wish to move them into a larger framework thus in the ritualistic part of life we have need for restoring certain of these daily values now what is the difference between a ritual and a commonplace activity the principles difference seems to be that a ritual is purposed and that in the attainment of its purpose it makes use of discipline the dancer wishing to be a great artist must pass through a long and trying period of discipline becoming perfect in technique in order that the technique shall no longer be visible if it is visible the perfection is not there the great musician does not wish to be regarded as a magnificent technician he wishes to possess the technique by means of which he can appear to be without technique but so complete in his control of his instrument that it moves with him and obeys his every instinct and every impulse thus it is not the purpose of the of great artistry to produce the evident artist but to produce the total artist 
evidenced only by the quality of achievement rather than the technical means by which it is accomplished. Ritual is then a, dis a disciplined use of natural instincts, natural impulses, in order that they may present a meaningful pattern for our own amazement or for the in informing of others. In India and other countries we have hand postures and body postures and we also have sound formulas by means of which ancient symbolic rites are perpetuated. We have the mudras, the positions of the hands, the hand, finger and body postures. We also have the mantrams, the sacred uh, groups of syllables, the garlands of sounds by means of which the gods of the ancient Vedas like to be worshipped. These were disciplined formulas and they all remind us of one thing that worship is discipline and that worship to become meaningful must be impelled by a regard great enough to make labor worthwhile that the discipline must be voluntary, that it must be because the end is so noble and so important that any struggle to achieve it is as nothing. Therefore, in the concept of ancient ritual, the perfection of it was due to the incredible dedication of peoples to these sacred ceremonies for which they prepared themselves by purification and by the most exacting disciplines of body control, even as great as that of yoga or the Vedantic systems. Everything had to be right, because it was worship, and who worshipped poorly could not expect the gods to be attentive. In worship, therefore, this disciplined procedure gave us the religious dance. And all ritual consists of two great procedures. One is man's offering to the gods. It is it man recognizing his dependence, recognizing his need, his eternal and unchanging requirement. And this requirement was always the same, that the gods of ages must be nigh unto him that only when he walked hand in hand with God could he walk surely and safely. Therefore, the uh, great ritual was a presentation of his need, a statement of his dedication, a bringing to the altar of the best of himself and the first of all things in his life. And the second expression of the ritual was the revelation of the law in living. The revelation of the sovereignty of good, man's tremendous exaltation in the simple realization that he lived in a divinely regulated world, that it was his right and his privilege to walk with the gods, that they were present, that he need ask nothing for himself, except that he might understand. There was no need for him to demand anything or plead for anything. It was a simple childlike thought or concept underlying it. The great faith in the presence of the parent and the great rejoicing that is born out of the realization that that faith is true. These were the two great things. Man quietly reaching out his hand to the invisible deity that governed him. And then, in his heart, having found that deity, performing the great rites of rejoicing, of exaltation, of crying forth the sheer joy of having found the faith and having felt within himself that he did live in the presence of an eternal light and that there could be no darkness. Thus the rituals primarily performed these functions 
They represented man reaffirming his allegiance to God and then reaffirming God's perfect working in the universe and in his own life. These ritual pageantries, therefore, gradually, as Pike points out, took on Pythagorean definitions. They took on patterns, patterns of stars and spheres and ancient squares, patterns of circumambulation, patterns of lights and altars, patterns of directions and corners of the world, patterns all of them based upon this universal realization that the ritual was the actual representation of the machinery of the cosmos that it was a revelation setting forth a living mechanism not on paper nor in stone the parts played by living persons who personified the elements the principles the laws and the truths and as you meditated upon these rites a further thought came to mind that these persons were not merely personifying laws for the sake of a ritual these persons are themselves and must forever be personifications of the law. Every move we make is a ritual of the law, revealing either our wisdom of it or our ignorance of it. That every symbolic situation in a temple or sanctuary has its equivalent situation in the world. Therefore, the ritual is life, and life is the ritual. The more this small ritual locked within the twelve days of the Iliocinia was actually played out in the eighty years of human life. The ritual was therefore adjusted to life. It not only became symbolic of life, but it became symbolic of how to live life well. Who followed the ritual in his conduct found the gods who recognized that living was a lawful unfoldment of beauty, that the great laws of nature combined to form ethics, combined to form morality, combined to form beauty, will cause the individual to suddenly experience the possibility of a constant ritualistic procedure in which every action of life is forever performed with beauty. That the individual no longer breaks the ritualistic formula of his own conduct. We could not imagine in the midst of a high mass some petty, trivial thing breaking in and disrupting this sacred atmosphere. Nor can we really understand why man, himself a divine being, fashioned in the image of a creating power, endowed with the attributes of a spiritual universal integrity, should suddenly become selfish, narrow, bigoted, fanatical, that he should transform his benevolence into hatreds, jealousies, and envies, and in this way destroy that thing most necessary to himself, as Plotinus explains in his essay on the beautiful. Actually, a beautiful life is a perfect ritual. And all ritualistic living is living in beauty, living in rhythm and harmony rather than in strange discords and broken chords and dissonances. The ritual then became the symbol of living. It became the symbol of gracious living. It pointed out that there is a divine way of doing everything. Just as there is a divine way that makes the corn to grow. Just as there is a divine way that brings the child into the world. Just as there is a divine way which meets sorrow with consolation. Everywhere in everything there is a divine way. That divine way is the sacred ritual, the sacred dance the sacred arts and sciences with their perfect keynotes and keyboards. Thus, the divine way is the service of the beauty of inward motion. Instead of the individual stalking through life like some puppet on high boots, 
the individual moves graciously through life like the flowing robes of the Quan Shi Yin or the Lady of Mercy of Eastern Wisdom. Here these beautiful figures, ever gracious, their bodies and their robes flowing in perfect rhythm and harmony are symbolic of the simple way to live, the simple experience of continuing graciousness of conduct, all motion being a movement of beauty within man, beautiful because man moves from beauty, harsh if man moves from harshness. In this way, the ritual carries us into the great principle of initiation. All over the world, as Pike points out, the sanctuaries of the old rites have disappeared. In a few places they linger on, in perhaps some instances with vigor, often with only a dwindling continuance of their ancient way. But gradually out of all of this has come forth the concept of the new sanctuary, the new house of initiation, the new temple of the mysteries, vaster and more splendid than the ancient temples of Elisus and Samothrace. This is indeed that tremendous temple whose spanning arches are the clasped hands of comrades. The world is now the sanctuary. The world is now the house of initiation. Its floor is the earth, and its ceiling is the sky. This great temple is where man, as observer and participant, observes from the cradle to the grave the tremendous passion play of human struggle. Here all ritual that has ever been, moving into the life of people, large and small, powerful and weak, here we see the terror play of ancient times. Here we come to tragedies and comedies greater than those of Aristophanes or Sophocles. Here every day things are happening stranger than fiction or drama. For this great vaulted world is the new temple of the mysteries. And in this temple man comes at birth. He no longer has to wait to be five years old to receive the lesser mysteries. He receives them as soon as his eyes open and he begins to see the world in which he exists. But he goes through them by degrees. He cannot move more rapidly than the unfolding faculties of his consciousness and the strengthening structure of his body will permit. Thus he grows in family, in home, and in school. These are the grades of the mysteries. And finally he comes uh, to the maturing of his faculties. And he stands or sits as in some ancient amphitheater, watching the drama of the world unfold. It is brought to him not only in his own immediate environment, but by the great methods of communication. He can now see what is happening on the opposite side of the earth. He can journey to distant places. The world becomes small. The experiences of all men are available to him. He can live with many races and many kinds of people and worship in many temples. All these things are now his birthright. So he stands somewhere along this line of existence, like those who come back to the greater mysteries, which must be conferred when the priests of time are ready to accept him. In this sanctuary then of today, we see the great mystery drama. We see everything from the atomic bomb uh, to interplanetary projected travel. We see all the inventions and the arts, but we have not the vision that was given to the ancient by his disciplines. We do not see behind all this immense confusion the shadowy figures of gods standing, waiting, hoping, or enraged. We do not recognize that behind this drama is law, law inevitable and irrefutable and immutable. We do not realize that all this phenomenon, the phenomenon suspends from one great numinal cause. We do not find that spirit whose body nature is, 
and God the soul. We have not this experience. Therefore, we profane the mysteries as Cambyses robbed the temples and sanctuaries of ancient initiation. The heathen came in, the conqueror, the dictator, spoiled the temple of its treasures, scattered its priests, and forced strange and foreign gods upon the worshippers. This is what has more or less happened today. The great temple of our world has been plundered of its mysteries, plundered of its sublimity, and of its great mystical meaning by the rise of conquerors. Some who have wanted to conquer space, and others conquer science, and some conquer death, some conquer life. But the conqueror has taken the place of the worshiper. We live no longer to enrich the temple, but to pillage it of its treasures. And our earth is indeed laid waste by the ambitions of men. So our civilization, like some ruined sanctuary of the past, may become only a wrecked and shadowed thing if we continue in our present forces. However, the old mysteries also pointed out that man does with this ritual according to himself. What he brings to it, he receives from it. The measure with which he understands measures the way in which he will be understood, and vice versa. Thus, between modern man and the true vision of this thing, there is no more than those few steps that separated the marketplace of Athens from the sanctuary of the mysteries. There was only a few steps, and man must take those steps in some way. He must take them by restoring the soul of learning in himself. He must, by a sh subtle shift, of his own perspective, suddenly find himself again in the temple. He is not in a factory. This world is not an institution. It is a sanctuary. It is not some strange prison or place of exile. It is not some terrible, uh, pressing burden upon the spirit. It is a sanctuary, but we do not know it. And because in so many cases our creeds have become a bondage upon our spirits, we have forgotten that the universe is free, that it is a free place of free worship, that it is a place in which men find their inner life on a marketplace, on a street, in a forest, or in some anchorite's cave. It makes no difference where. But they are forever in the presence of the great ritual. The ritual that science examines in test tubes and under microscopes. The ritual that electronic science seeks with its mathematical formulas. All formulas, all research projects, all these things are explorations by ritualistic means into ritualistic mysteries. All the rest is of a seeming. This is of the fact. And each scientist today pays homage to the ancient gods because he does not dare to perform an experiment which is contrary to law. The law holds him, and he cannot escape it. He knows if the law is broken, the experiment cannot succeed. He denies the lawmaker, but he cannot evade the law. If then, in this thinking, we find uh, Pike's point of value, then by being taken into a house of initiation, into some sanctuary of rites, into some secret body of those bound by obligations, and there perceives the unfolding of some ritual of hoary antiquity. This individual may, perhaps, if he has a sheer genius in his spirit, and in this case, the genius means a good daemon or a spiritual protector, perhaps uh, a guardian angel. But if he has this spirit in himself, he suddenly finds in the unfolding of the temple ceremony the key to his total living. He becomes aware that he is simply being told that he has been given a new dimension of awareness a new way of looking at things, something that changes patterns and situations 
just as truly and mysteriously and as wonderfully as Joseph Smith's eyeglasses are supposed to have done in the story of Mormonism. That by means of a new pair of glasses he can read something that no one else has ever been able to read, at least not without the same pair of glasses or one they're like. But actually all you have to have in order to read the mystery to read the strange characters traced by living nations, races, and persons upon the face of the earth. All that we need is the proper pair of glasses, the proper way of seeing. And the ritualistic procedure is an introduction to a new dimension of seeing. It is that which enables us to see not things, but through things. A kind of seeing which enables us to avoid the delusion of the evident. Something which gives, it, gives to us this penetrating capacity to make veils become transparent because our own sight has gained a new penetrating power. The key is, secret, is simple enough. It is so obvious that few find it. And that is this simple fact that when we observe under tutelage or under direction a certain ritual and are told that it has a meaning, we are then stimulated to look for it. But when we turn away from this and our scholars, our scientists, all our most progressive leaders, really progressive ones, tell us that this world also has a meaning we are not inspired to seek it. We assume we see it already, that its meaning is given to us in terms of wars and taxes, earthquakes, pestilences, and local smog. That this is it. And that we are fortunate indeed if we can pass through our four score years with a reasonable degree of comfort and make a somewhat dignified exit. That is all there is to it. It has never occurred to us to apply this key the key to break through the obvious. The key by means of which men like Troynbe, for instance, have discovered that history is not merely a record, history is a motion. History is a dance. Nations dance their dance of death. Nations whirl themselves like some strange Muslim dervish into their own eternity. That all the things that we talk about are really great symbolic patterns and that from these we can if we have the insight discover the whole mystery of existence that instead of having to read thousands of books we can open our eyes and watch the living book of nature the living book of life human nature national policies and there is not a day that goes by that the most deformed and defamed misrepresentation of news in our daily papers does not at the same time contain the secret of immortality for someone if he knows how to read it. It is the secret of the difference between life and death to read not the line nor between the line but through the line into that part of universal pattern which this story reveals. And even though it has not been truly told, still some of the pattern is still there. Thus, by the observation of ritual, we become aware that we must never allow ourselves merely to accept. Not accept in the sense of intellectually acknowledging this I see is enough. We are saved to a degree, as I said earlier, by the fact that we do not intellectualize ritual for the most part. We do find a receptivity and simply permit it to move us. We can do to a measure the same thing with life. But we must be sure that the thing that moves us is the true part, the true meaning of the right, the true significance of that which is unfolding and occurring around us. I would say then that Pike's thinking in bringing it down to uh, more factual terms is that the ancients took the world, made a miniature of it and called it rite or ceremony. 
They then took the ceremony and taught their disciples to unfold it until they were able to rediscover the world from which the rite was taken. The ritual or ceremony was great this, captured in a, in a miniature pageantry. A man beholding the miniature pageantry could move through it into the greatness for which it stood. Thus it was a two-way road, a road of bringing great things within the reach of man, and also of lifting man so that he was in the reach of great things. This double process means and meant at that time that in the ritual was combined what we call today religion, philosophy, and science. Under philosophy we would have education. Under science all experimental and phenomenal knowledge. And under religion all estimation and apperception of causation. The divine metaphysics of the spheres. These things were there. And education theoretically and factually began by man being exposed to these models of the world. It is said the ancient in his wisdom made little models of great things. And these little models became the toys of the young. These little models of great things are the symbols within which man hid his knowledge. And they became the playthings of the young. For we as peoples, unaware of their sacredness, used for toys those laws and principles and those productions within which the secret of universal truth uh, was concealed. So out of this all, this point, comes one kind of mood which we would like to try to capture for a moment. And that is this mood of persistent inquiry. This mood of man suddenly finding a new focusing of his sense of sight and hearing so that he could become aware of value under surface. As Maimonides said, beneath the body of the law is the soul of the law. Beneath the soul of the law is the spirit of the law. Paracelsus said that those who would understand the mysteries of nature must walk the book with their feet. In other words, they, they must search in this great world of, of pageantries as we see them and know them. Never disillusioned, never disappointed, never discouraged, but recognizing the play of the dots unfolding upon the great stage of human affairs. Someone asked uh, Plato on one occasion what his profession was, and he replied, I am by profession an observer. A man, to a great degree, finds this a useful point. The observer has tremendous advantages in many things. Apuleius, being initiated into the rites of Mithras, declares that he was the spectator of divine things. If we could capture in our consciousness that every moment when we open our eyes in the morning till we close them at night, we are spectators of divine things. If we could get this value, we would begin to know what education means. We would realize that behind everything that happens is a formula. That this formula must be understood. And that security, release from suffering, all the virtues of Buddha's Eightfold Path are available to the individual who becomes the spectator to divine things and knows it. He is no longer captured in this strange confusion that we commonly experience. He is never so deep in anything that he is not able to be quiet and watch the workings of the law. Thus as a candidate seeing a drama unfold upon the stage, he may applaud it, he may admire it, but he must never forget that it is only a veiled representation of something else, that it is only a play, and that this play is based upon a great formula of laws. To recognize this could bring us back to a lawful religion. It could bring us back to a religion based upon man's 
recognition of the sublimity of the tremendous total existence in which we live, in which we no longer fear this existence, or merely respect it, or seek to exploit it, or even attempt to formularize it, but rather that in this whole existence we are capable of the immediate impact of a great spiritual identity, a tremendous divine principle, a principle to be met with veneration, a principle not remote, not some cruel and distant God, but a principle ever imminent, a principle immediate, as small as the smallest need, as great as the greatest problem. This, com this complete, internal, ever-existing principle of value. If we could sense this, we could begin to dream of a universal religion, a religion that goes beyond stars and planets and everything of that nature, and really is represented by the great ritual of man's truth-seeking. In all the candidate rites of ancient mysteries, the candidate became the embodiment of the truth seeker. He was the one for whom the mysteries existed. No candidate, no mysteries. The mysteries were not necessary to themselves. And in the great universe of value, there is no mystery. Mystery is only possible where the individual who seeks knowledge does not already know. Therefore the mystery represents the quest of the ever-present, man desperately seeking something that he has already found and doesn't know it. The individual seeking in the furthermost for that which is already his in the innermost. So that the, the mystery of the truth seeker making the perilous journey through the strange tests and trials of subterranean rites. This is only the story of the journey of the human consciousness uh, toward the awareness of its own eternity. It is the removal from man of the blindness in his own eyes, for the darkness is not in the world, but it is in him. And if he can change his own perspective, the dark world gives way to a radiant and glorious sphere. Now many individuals will say, like the rituals of old, that some of the rites were cruel and terrible, and that the candidate was exposed to terrific tests and trials which were more than flesh could bear, and that it, was might, that it might well happen that the candidate would not survive, but failing in the mysteries would never return again to the world that he had known. These symbolic statements were not so different from life. For every day we see people who seem to fail. We see persons who have gone a little way and can never return to the life that once they knew, yet they do not seem to be able to break through into that fuller life they need. We can also constantly visualize in our mind terrible monsters, ogres, dragons, and horrible fire-belching fiends guarding the way to peace. And we feel that this nation or that discovery or this individual is, is the adversary of all good. And therefore, that we must, like some Siegfried of old, slay this dragon with the sword of our detachment. All this is ritual. Ritual thinking on the part of man. Ritual that has never realized that behind the mask of the monster is the kindly face of one of our own neighbors. It is hard for us to realize this. Harder still when we see this apparently kindly person doing what appears to be terrible things. And as far as we know and as he knows, they are terrible things. But behind all these terrible things, there must be a just law. If there is not this law, then all our faith is in vain. If there is not a truth stronger than evil, if there is not a reality more powerful than darkness and error, if there is not a sovereignty that is immutable at the root of everything, then all we struggle in vain. There is nothing. Only a 
little life rounded by a sleep. Uh, therefore, our own innate consciousness must tell us that somewhere behind this veil of horrors which we see so often depicted in the rituals and the rites of old times, that there is a plan and a purpose. And we are reminded, of course, in this of the great thought in the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna explains to Arjuna why he must go forth and fight the good fight on the battlefield of life. Krishna explains to the young prince that actually birth and death, living, departing, hope, fear, hate, war, misery, pain, all of these things are like strange shadows that come and go but have no substance. That behind all of these things there is truth, supreme, inevitable. That death is not real and never can be. It is only a seeming that we have accepted as real because we have no glasses with which to see the truth. That wrong is an appearance, not a fact. That behind all injustice stands an eternal statue of justice that cannot be moved. And that everything we call injustice is so named because our own understanding is less than our need. That nothing happens not a sparrow's fall, but it is within the law. And that this law is not a law of vengeance, but a law of life, a law of eternal good. It is up to us to find it. It is not up to us to shake our fists against the heavens. It is up to us to find the truth, to end this long candidate existence by taking the trials, passing through and coming finally into the aditam of the temple, there to see our brothers who have gone before in their robes of blue and gold, waiting to receive us and to assure us and reassure us that we have wakened from a sleep of error into a light of truth, that all this horrible monstrosity which we have fashioned and perpetuated with our ignorance dies when ignorance dies in us, and that just as surely as we come through a valley of shadow, so surely we have within ourselves the capacity to live together in the light of peace. Between this sorry world and the golden time we look for is nothing but the bridge or interval of our own understanding. When we really know life, to be the natural, spontaneous obedience to principle, man moving with the gods, then life and ritual become one. The symbol and the substance are no longer divided, and all this wonderful pageantry is revealed with its true purpose, that it must show the man the way, and that this way was anciently taught in the mysteries, and that this way comes down to us now as ancient instruction applicable to the greater mystery of daily life. And if we use the ancient wisdom and apply it to the life of today, we shall find that we can successfully pass through the rituals and come in the end to that new birth in time by which we are born into the maturity of ourselves and return once more to the family of the enlightened from which, as the uh, hymn of the robe of glory tells us, we once departed. So man descending into ignorance and rising therefrom again, his story is the ritual. And out of the ritual and the story, he gains the key to the conscious restoration and resurrection of himself. This is the concept behind Pike's understanding of ritual. And he believes that any presentation by means of which these facts can be driven home to us, will not cause us necessarily to be ritual perfect or ceremony perfect, but will cause us to move to the recognition of the greater right, that the great mystery is the one that man masters through the use of wisdom as a key to unlock the unknown, and through virtue, through beauty, through grace, and through consciousness, he gains this wonderful sword, this Excalibur, this blade of the enlightened will, 
by means of which he can protect himself. And as the Knights of the Grail expressed it, the younger knights use the blade of this sword to fight dragons. But when the wiser knights face the great adversary, they reverse the blade and holding up the cruciform hilt, discomfort the evil one with the symbol of eternal life. So that the sword no longer cuts, but becomes again the Kreuzansetta, the key of life. And the will that no longer cuts and is reversed and held up as the symbol of consciousness becomes the master keyword, the lost word of the ritual. These facts and points lead on to many things, but perhaps we have captured in some small way uh, the concept underlying Pike's desire that we should recognize the dignity and eternal significance of ritual. Thank you very kindly.